Hello, it's the 28th of March and it's Palm Sunday. Our readings for this morning are Psalm 118 and Mark chapter 11 verses 1 to 11. If you haven't already read those, please pause and do so now. We're drawing towards the end of our journey through Mark's Gospel, and so drawing towards the end of Jesus' time on earth. In this morning's reading in Mark, Jesus for the first time goes public about who he really is. Up until this point, whenever he has been recognised as the Messiah, and whenever he's done something that points to his identity as the Son of God, he's told the witnesses not to tell anybody. The demons he cast out in chapters 1 and 3 are ordered not to name him. The people he heals are told not to tell. When Peter declares, you are the Christ, in chapter 8, he is told not to tell anyone. And on the way back down the mountain after the transfiguration, Peter, James and John are instructed to say nothing of what they have seen until he has risen from the dead. Why? Why did Jesus insist on keeping his identity a secret? Why didn't he tell everyone who he was all along? Perhaps when we look at what happens when he does identify himself, we will have our answer. By making the entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, Jesus declared publicly for the first time that he was the promised Messiah. This act was heavy with symbolism for the Jewish people. King David had had his son Solomon ride on a mule into Jerusalem to confirm that he would succeed to the throne after David instead of his other son, Adonijah. Most significantly, Zechariah, in chapter 9 of his book, had prophesied that the Saviour would come riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. A king riding on a donkey, as opposed to a great horse, was a king with peaceful intent. The prophecy was that the king of Israel would establish an era of peace. The people thronging the streets in Jerusalem at Passover time were familiar with these stories and with the prophecy, and they recognised Jesus' theatrical act for what it was, a declaration that he was the one who was going to set people free to live in peace for all time. And within a week, he was dead, his earthly ministry over. Jesus had waited until the proper time, the time of Passover, when the people of God were thinking about salvation. At Passover, the Jews remember that prior to the escape from Egypt, there was a plague of death. And only those who painted the blood of a sacrificial lamb on their doorways were spared when the angel of death passed over their dwellings. The festival is a time of remembrance that we are all subject to death and that only God in his mercy can save. Jesus, knowing that he was the once and for all sacrifice, timed the revelation of his true nature to perfection, ensuring that he would be sacrificed at precisely the right moment. But for now, the crowd are delighted to greet their promised saviour. The response of the crowd to Jesus' revelation of his identity was to worship. They worship God and they worship Jesus as the Messiah, using the words of Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna is both a shout of praise and a cry for help. It literally means save us now. So it's a way of both acknowledging our need for help and putting Jesus in his rightful place as the one who can save. I'd like this morning to reflect on the worship of this crowd. What characterises good worship and where the crowd get it right and where they go wrong? And what can we learn from this? The crowd are actually pretty good worshippers. First, the crowd is able to praise under pressure. The whole of this event is carried out under the shadow of the Roman Empire. Shortly before Jesus entered Jerusalem on his humble little donkey, historians tell us that Pontius Pilate had staged his own ceremonial procession into Jerusalem. He would have been riding a huge war horse and flanked by ranks of armed soldiers on horseback and foot soldiers carrying banners with gilded eagles mounted on poles, drums beating, they marched through the streets. This was to make sure everybody remembered who was in charge. At least officially, the Roman emperor was regarded as the son of God and Pilate made sure that the Jewish crowd gathered to celebrate their freedom from captivity many years before 
remembered who was in charge now. Yet despite this looming cloud of oppression, people still praised God. Amidst the praising, there are religious men who try to silence the crowd. In Luke's Gospel, we read that the Pharisees commanded Jesus to tell his followers to stop their praise. And Jesus replied that if the people were quiet, the stones would cry out. Because when Jesus is seen for who he really is, praise is the only response. No matter what the circumstances and no matter how many detractors there may be. So if you find it hard to praise, spend time focusing on Jesus, on who he is, on what he has done for you and what he has accomplished for all people and praise will follow. Second, the crowd's worship is characterised by thanksgiving. The crowd are using Psalm 118 to give thanks to God that he has rescued them, even before that rescue has taken place. They're thanking God for saving them, even before they are set free. And this is the right attitude to come to worship with. The need for thanksgiving is reiterated by Paul in Philippians chapter 4, when he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in all things, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We're to give thanks to God in all circumstances, even those that might make us anxious. We're to thank God for answering our prayers at the same time as we pray them. And we are promised peace that passes all understanding when we do. Thirdly, the crowd's worship is characterised by creativity. The crowd use whatever comes to hand to aid their worship. In this case, their clothes, and branches that they cut from the fields. Just ordinary objects become utensils of worship. In other gospels, it mentions that the crowd would wave palm branches. Apparently, these would not have grown in the hilly terrain around Jerusalem, but were likely imported from the lower ground around the Jordan River. It's likely that enterprising individuals would have brought these branches up to the town to sell to pilgrims to use in the festivities, rather like the peddlers of nylon flags who spring up in towns and cities here whenever a royal person visits today. Everyone wants something to wave to join in the celebration, and the entrepreneurs and the creative ones find a way to make it happen. Fourth and finally, the crowd's worship includes using their voices. Singing is used in worship throughout the Bible. Psalms were set to music. People sing and rejoice at various times. The crowd in this reading are shouting the same things, joining their voices together. This is an experience like no other. Saying or singing the same words in unison or in harmony is a powerful and uplifting force. We have all missed singing together so much over the last year, and it's exciting to hear that we are going to be allowed to sing again together on Easter Sunday morning at our outdoor service. I'm really looking forward to being part of the congregation next week lifting up our voices together in song, praising God and worshipping him as one. These four characteristics of worship, praise under pressure, thanksgiving, creativity and singing, are all present in this crowd. Interestingly, they're all also well known for improving our sense of well-being. Psychologists tell us that fostering thankfulness, being creative and singing all gladden our hearts and lift our mood. But when you consider that God has made us for this purpose, to worship him, then it's not surprising that doing so makes us happy. The Westminster Catechism says that the chief end of man and women is to worship God and enjoy him forever. Worship is our primary function in life, and it is in worshipping God that we find true fulfilment. So what goes wrong with this crowd? Why are they worshipping Jesus on Palm Sunday and asking for him to be crucified the following Friday? I think the answer lies in their expectations. We've looked in the last few weeks at the expectations of the disciples, how they couldn't comprehend that Jesus might die, and so they simply don't hear in any meaningful way his predictions that he will be killed in Jerusalem. The people, disciples included, are all caught up in the idea that the Messiah will get rid of the Romans for them. They don't see the bigger picture and the bigger plan, which is to get rid of the real enemy, 
the enemy not just of the Jews in the first century, but the enemy of all people in all times, sin. They expect Jesus to come to power, to raise an army, to incite a rebellion and lead a revolution. But instead, this passage in Mark ends on a huge anticlimax. Jesus rides into Jerusalem like the promised Messiah King. People are shouting and singing and praising God. People are excited to see what he will do next. And when he arrives at the temple, he has a good look around and goes back to Bethany. He rides through the shouting, cheering, waving, desperate crowd, gets off his donkey, has a look around and leaves. Did the palm wavers go back to their hotels that evening, feeling disappointed, do you think? Did they so quickly change their minds about who Jesus was when he failed to meet their expectations? We need to guard against the same error. It's great to shout Hosanna to our Saviour, to praise Jesus for setting us free from the tyranny of sin and death. It's great to give thanks to God for answering our prayers, even as we pray them. But if we own Jesus as our Saviour, we must also own him as Lord, because he is both. He cannot be your Saviour if he is not also your Lord. And that means accepting his way. Accepting that the prayer you prayed might not be answered just when or how you wanted it. That you cannot live your life any way you please. That some things are not permitted and other things that you don't want to do are necessary. Can we call Jesus our Lord and not follow him to the cross? The Christian life is one of sacrifice, denial of self and acceptance of Christ as Lord. The crowd were shouting out to Jesus, Hosanna, save us. And he did. He did save them. He answered their prayer and he saved them, but not in the way they expected. He could have overthrown the Roman Empire with a word. But within a generation, a new oppressor would likely have risen up. His way was better. It involved sacrifice, pain, humiliation and rejection but it resulted in eternal glory for Jesus and for those who will follow him. So as we go into Easter week and think about the final days of Jesus's ministry on earth, let's look at how we worship. Do we praise him under pressure? Can we give thanks even before we see the answers to our prayers? Can we use our creative minds and voices to glorify him in our lives? And can we follow in his footsteps the way of sacrifice to the cross of our Lord and Saviour? May God bless you this week and I'm looking forward to seeing you all very soon.